Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. In Canada, we have a lot of maple trees. In the fall season, maples become red. It is so beautiful that I always correlate it to good fortune and fruitfulness. No matter where you are from, I'm sure there are different symbols for the fall season. Anyway, today's video is the second in the internal style concept series. I'm happy that many of you enjoyed the first video in the series, and uh, I appreciate all the feedback. Learning the similarity and the differences can help us see the complete picture of the internal styles and help us to appreciate their intricates. I hope my contract video series encourages people to cross-train in multiple internal styles while this new series helps to unite the internal martial art community. I honestly feel sad about the siloed nature of the internal style community. Not just between the internal styles, but even within each internal style. I believe easy access to knowledge and better communication and outreach will go a long way in raising the skill level and hence the reputation of the entire community. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Now let's get on with today's topic. You may have noticed a theme in all of my videos. In every video, I first talk about the history and the impact of a philosophical or cultural concept before explaining its use in martial art. This is because, in my opinion, Understanding the important historical and cultural background of any practice, especially the key terms used in practice, can have a great value in improving your understanding of the art. I firmly believe the true value of the further development of these arts in the modern time is physical and spiritual cultivation. One has to balance the benefit provided by this practice including health, self-defense, psychological, and spiritual well-being, and lots more. Personally, I always try to broaden my understanding of this practice and try to find a way to maximize the potentials within them. When I was a child, my family forced me to practice these arts. In the beginning, I did not see the value of them since I just followed their arrangement unwillingly. However, with time, I gradually realized that my family made the right decision of forcing me to work on this practice. Then I got addicted to this practice and then never have stopped from then on. Of course, I lost a lot of opportunities for having other activities, including making new friends, playing cards, and so on. When I look back, I always feel that I missed something as a child. But time just passed by and there is nothing I can do to catch it back. So, to be positive, I appreciate the effort that my family made to me. So I was forced to practice in the first place. But I'm sure all of you are in a different situation. No one forces you to practice, and you just enjoy doing it based on your own decision. After I moved to the West, I have met a lot of people who are very serious in practice. I was so impressed in the beginning. I even thought that some of them might be a reincarnation of a Chinese person. By the way, not being religious myself, I'm not so sure about reincarnation. Right now, I'm just using this word to express my feeling. I have taught many students in Canada for two decades. 
I can say that some of them are much better than many people who practice the same styles in China. Now, you may want to know the reason for talking about this. Well, based on my teaching experience, if a teacher emphasizes to explain the philosophical, cultural, and historical related background information in teaching, students would be able to master the core of the practice. Yes, there are cultural differences and those can be a huge barrier for a non-Chinese person to practice these Chinese arts and to reach a high level. But this barrier can of course be overcome. I hope to break down this cultural barrier by translating and interpreting as much knowledge to English as I possible can. This is why in my recent lecture series, I always initially provide the cultural and the philosophical context to any martial concept. With time, I'm sure the way you appreciate the art will be different, and hopefully, it will have an impact on your practice. If it also drives any of you to practice other cultural art like painting, philosophy, calligraphy, or poetry, I will consider that a bonus. So, topics covered in today's video include First, Lao Zi and Da Xiang Wu Xing. Second, Da Xiang Wu Xing and Chinese aesthetics. Third, impact on Chinese martial arts. Fourth, front hand and back hand. Fifth, demonstration. Sixth, takeaways. Let's get started. Topic 1 Lao Zi and Da Xiang Wu Xing. Many of you may already be familiar with Lao Zi, an ancient Chinese philosopher, thinker, and author of Tao Te Ching, or the Book of Tao. In the 41st chapter of his book, he said, Da Yan Xi Sheng, Da Xiang Wu Xing, or Zhan Yuan music is hardly audible, true image is nearly invisible. Some other translations, such as great music has the faintest nose, great form is beyond shape, are also very close to its meaning. Most people will find this sentence hard to understand, but if you contemplate on it, it may become very profoundly meaningful not only in philosophy but also in other fields as well. Naturally, it became part of the Chinese aesthetic standard in appreciating and evaluating these arts. Indeed, this sentence can be considered as the overall guiding principle of Chinese art, especially music, painting, opera, calligraphy, poetry, and literature. If you have watched my videos introducing the Yi Jing concept, or aesthetic consumption theory, a theory that I borrowed from Chinese aesthetics to analyze the internal styles, it would be much easier to understand today's topic, the Da Xiang Wu Xing concept. Let me remind you that Yi Jing, the concept, should not be confused with Yi Jing, the book. Now, Let's consider the term Da Xiang Wu Xing. Da means great, Xiang means image, Wu means without, Xing means form. Together, this term is very often used to express that a great art is formless. Many scholars believe that originally Lao Zi used this term to express the idea that the Great Tao is formless. Lao Tzu believed that the origin of the universe was the Great Tao. 
something beyond the sense of our visual observation. People only can comprehend and experience the Great Tao without seeing it, since the Great Tao is formless. Here, Great Image is another name of Great Tao. We all know that philosophical concepts are often applied in other fields by adding some new meanings on the original ideas. Da Xiang Wu Xing originally meant the Great Tao is formless. Later, it acquired a different meaning. The true image is formless. In order to make it comprehensible to the common people, it acquired yet another meaning. The true image that is nearly invisible, or great form is beyond shape, and so on. By doing so, it became possible to apply it to Chinese aesthetics. Like Lao Tzu mentioned in his book that non-existence or emptiness and the insubstantial entity have to be expressed by existence and substantial entity. So, people use some visible arts to express the invisible concept. That is the value of the philosophical term Da Xiang Wu Xing, or the Great Image is Formless. Second topic Da Xiang Wu Xing and Chinese Aesthetics. I already mentioned that this term is widely used in Chinese aesthetics in the last topic. Here, I would like to elaborate it more. Da Xiang, or the Great Image, or the Great Tao, is one of the core concepts in Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching. In many parts of his book, he described the nature of the Great Tao as simplicity and emptiness. Emptiness is the form of simplicity, and simplicity can be expressed by emptiness. For more than 2000 years, simplicity has been a key concept in Chinese aesthetics, and its applications can be found in almost every field. I would like to show you some pictures of certain arts following this aesthetics concept. The first, painting. This painting is called Autumn Landscape, a famous work by the great artist Zhang Daqian. He used some strong color to express the beauty of nature. Second, furniture. In the Ming Dynasty, Chinese furniture reached the highest level in terms of expression of the concept of uh, simplicity. Please look at this Ming style furniture photos. Third, calligraphy. Pay attention to the empty place of some strokes. Those empty places in some strokes actually strengthen the feeling of uh, solidity. Chinese ceramics. These simple designs, including its shape and color, perfectly illustrate the concept of Da Xiang Wu Xing. In the interest of time, I will only limit it to these examples. By the way, many people will still find it very hard to see the concept applied in an example since it requires a bit of a culture and artistic training. If that is you, do not worry. For now, you can just take my word for it. With time, I'm sure you will see what I mean. Topic 3. Impact on Chinese martial art. The purpose of introducing this term is to help you understand the application of this concept in martial art training. In Chinese martial art community, people use this term to describe a practice that looks simple 
but very hard to replicate with full martial effect. To give you an idea, think of a movement that may look simple enough that anybody could do easily. Yet, when a beginner does it, the movement and its effect look very different compared to an expert. And it takes years of regular practice for someone to master it. As a result, since a very simple movement may contain a lot of small details, people call an expert level result of practice Da Xiang Wu Xing, or the great image is formless. It is a poetic term to describe that a high level of practice looked simple and subtle. So, from decades ago, this term is becoming more and more popular in Chinese martial art community. For example, consider my YouTube videos posted about 13 years ago, especially the Xing Yi videos. Those have been some of the most popular videos not only in the West but also in China. My 5 Elements and Lincoln Form demonstration has over 700,000 views on YouTube, while on Chinese sites it is in the millions. Very often, people ask me how to practice Fa Jin since Fa Jin is considered as a secret of Xing Yi practice. By the way, Fa Jin is not limited to Xing Yi. It is pre present in all of the Chinese style of martial arts, possibly in many other martial arts as well, but with different names. For quite a while in the past, I would advise people to simply follow the Xing Yi principle to develop Fa Jin, no matter what style they actually practiced. To the same question, Shang Ya Cheng, one of my good friends from Beijing, a Xing Yi expert who passed away a couple of years ago, once told me that I should start using the term Da Xiang Wu Xing to answer this kind of question, since according to him, that my Xing Yi demonstrations contains many small details integrated into the simple movement. The movements look very simple but are hard to correctly replicate without the correct method. Furthermore, with regard to the subtle detail, you can see it only if you know it. That's why the term Da Xiang Wu Xing precisely describes such a practice. Therefore, in the internal style, depth is simplicity, is a standard to evaluate practice. A movement is very simple but requires a countless times of repetition with the correct method. Da Xiang Wu Xing can be used to describe the training result here. I hope more and more people will be able to appreciate this unique type of beauty in the internal style. Topic 4. Front Hand and Back Hand I just mentioned that in order to reach the level of depth in simplicity, you should focus on some important details in practice. Today, I'd like to talk about a key principle in martial art training, especially in the three internal styles. The term in Chinese is qian shou da ren, hou shou fa li, or the front hand attacks the opponent but the back hand releases the power. After years of teaching, I realized that these two sentences did not sufficiently describe the correct practice. So, I added two more sentences to follow up. They are Xiong Yao Ning Zhuan, Li Chuan Yu Shen, or the chest and the waist turns and the power will be transferred through the body. Together, it becomes Qian Shou Da Ren, Hou Shou Fa Li, Xiong Yao Ning Zhuan, Li Chuan Yu Shen. 
or the front hand attacks the opponent, but the back hand releases power. The chest and the waist turn, and the power will be transferred through the body. Now, let me explain it further. When you attack the opponent, even though you may use the front hand or the attacking hand, the force is actually generated by the subtle movement of the back hand. The body transferred power initiated by the body's turning motion and the back hand's intensifying motion simultaneously. The movement of the back hand is so subtle that it's almost invisible if you do not know about it. That is the invisible form in a great image. In other words, Da Xiang Wu Xing. By the way, there are some other movements that do not follow this body mechanism in force power generation. I will talk about them in the future. But for now, let's focus on some movements which require us to follow this principle. So, what are these movements? Well, in any martial art, if a movement involves two hands to move in different directions, then this principle will apply. For example, all of the Xing Yi five elements have to follow this principle. Many Tai Chi movements involving Li as its energy format will also apply this principle. And uh, for Ba Gua, it can say that most of the movements follow this principle. Remember, the body is not only the key in power generation, but also critical in power transformation. So, a key application of this principle is being able to alternate the tensity of the body structure where one hand handles the attack and the other accelerates and strengthens the result. It requires regular pr physical practice, mental focus, correct timing. Now, let me actually demonstrate this principle. Topic 5 Demonstration. Theory without demonstration leads to a hollow knowledge transfer. Physical demonstration should be added after introducing a theoretical concept, or it would become just an empty shell. Today, I'd like to demonstrate one or two movements from each internal style to explain this theory. For Xing Yi, I will use the fire fist and the wood fist. So, the fire movement, let's say this pulsar, okay? When you attack with the front fist, actually, the force is from the movement of the, the, the back fist. Turn and transfer the force from the arm to shoulder, then to the arm. That's how we <coughs> have the force. To the wood movement, it follows the same principle that, see, when you, when you punch, then the back, the, the back fist transfers the force then to the front, <coughs> front fist. That is the key in the Xing Yi practice. In Tai Chi, I will use the Yan Shou Hong Chui. To Tai Chi, let's, yeah, let's take Yan Shou Hong Chui as example to demonstrate this. So let's see from this poster. So this move I just force transfer from here. Then nothing new. Then from here, extend. Then later the force, the power of the right fist actually from the, the force from the left hand elbow to the shoulder. So this move, the last second, the force transforming movement is the key to generate the great power of the front fist. So the power of the front fist comes from the back arm, back hand, back fist. Again, let me show again. One, two, three, then four.
to Ba Gua, I will use the single changing palm, the first eight big palm to demonstrate it. Okay, to Ba Gua, let's take the single change palm as example to demonstrate this concept. For example, at this posture, the power of force from the front hand is actually from the small motion of the back hand, this, this part. Okay, so let me demonstrate it from the beginning. One, two, three, then four, then other movement. So pay attention to the small subtle movement of the back hand in order to transfer the force from the back arm, then through the body to the front, front hand is the key of a better power generation in internal styles. Topic six, take aways. Once again, a short video, but I covered a lot of interesting topics. Da Xiang Wu Xing and its origin have been introduced. Da Xiang Wu Xing and its application in different arts have been explained. The applications of Da Xiang Wu Xing in martial art training, especially in the internal styles, have been elaborated and demonstrated. Now, I hope you have developed some insight into this principle. It's okay if you don't fully grasp, but I advise you to pay attention to the details I mentioned earlier and incorporate them into your practice. Formlessness cannot be achieved without first following the correct form. With regular practice of the correct form, you will reach the great image and the formlessness. That's in today's video. Thank you for watching. See you next time and enjoy your practice.